Well, good morning, Walden Church. We are now three weeks into our new Easter series entitled Come and See. It's the idea that I'm taking you by the hand, right? I'm reaching out my hand, taking you by the hand and saying, come and see Jesus. I got this idea from John chapter 1. Uh, the first part of John chapter 1, uh, John the Baptist sees Jesus and points him out to his disciples and his disciples leave him and go walk behind Jesus. And Jesus says, what do you guys want? And the disciples say, we want to be where you are. Where are you staying? And Jesus says, come and see. And a little down the page, a little further in John chapter 1, we see the disciples talking to each other, getting excited, saying, we have found the Messiah. He is Jesus of Nazareth. And Nathanael says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip says, come and see. So it's this idea, these 10 weeks before Easter begins, that we're going to ask questions. And ultimately, this is going to be a trip. This is going to be a journey where I can reach out by the hand and say, come and see. Come and see the Messiah. And I know there's lots of sermons about Jesus. We talk about Jesus all the time. Preach about Jesus. Tell all the stories. Books have been written. Everything that can be said has been said. But I don't think so. I don't want this Easter season to sneak up on you. I don't want the cross to just appear out of nowhere. I want you to be ready. And so as we make our way to the cross, as we make our way to the empty tomb, I want to ask these questions and seriously look at a picture of Jesus that maybe we've never considered. Last time we were together, we saw Jesus heal. We saw his healing ministry. We saw him raise the dead. And we said we should be unafraid to approach our God with any of our requests, that it's never too late, that God has time for all of us, that Jesus is never inconvenienced by us, that he goes out of his way to help us. And so this morning I wanted to continue to look at Jesus' healing ministry, and we're in John chapter 9 today. Verse 1 says, As Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked, Rabbi, who sinned? this man or his parents, that he was born blind. The disciples ask, who is responsible, right? Who is responsible for this blindness? And it's because back in Jesus' day, there was an understanding that God is just, and so we are being punished. And if God is just, and you are punished, then you are getting what you deserve. So this is a story about blindness. But whose blindness? In verse 1, it says Jesus saw a man, right? Saw a man, saw a blind man. But the disciples, they see a sinner. And they say, Rabbi, what did this man do to deserve blindness? Obviously, right? If this man is blind, then he deserved it. After all, God made him blind, right? And we live in God's world. God is in control. The Old Testament, Deuteronomy 32, says the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are just, a God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is he. The book of Psalm, but the Lord sits enthroned forever. He has established his throne for justice, and he judges the world with righteousness. He judges the people with uprightness. God is just. Absolutely. So then, consequently, if we are being punished, if God takes something away from us, then obviously we deserved it. But does that mean that God is only just? I mean, after all, here is a man, he is blind, and God is just. So obviously, this man is receiving a just punishment. But does that mean that blindness is deserved? No. Just because God is just doesn't mean that everything that happens to me is deserved, does it? I mean, did you deserve to get laid off? Did you deserve to get divorced? Did you deserve to get cancer? Did you deserve to lose that pregnancy? 
we ask this question and something happens to us and we say, what did I do to deserve this, right? Or we see it on an even bigger scale or a global scale or we see it when it happens to the rich. The rich prosper. Celebrities and sports figures, they prosper, they get famous and we say, ah, oh, they don't deserve that. They don't deserve that. So how does Jesus respond? How does Jesus respond to the disciples' question? Verse 3, Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. Jesus says, you've got it wrong. You got it all wrong. That's the wrong question, Jesus says. Because you see, somewhere along the way, we got to thinking that good people suffer. Evil people prosper. Good people don't get what they deserve, but evil people, they get what they don't deserve. But God is in control, right? And he is just, right? Well, yeah, God is in control and he's just, but I don't know, he's not always good. What do you mean he's not always good? Well, he doesn't always you know, reward and dole out grace the way I would. But that makes no sense. If God is just, then he is good. Isn't God good? Isn't God merciful? Eh, not always. What do we see Jesus do next? In verse 6, Having said these things, he spits on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. This man, let me, let's just back this up. This man was born blind, born blind from birth, right? Has never been able to see. So we, we have no idea what his condition is, right? We don't know how his eyes were broken or if he even had eyes or, or how his vision had never developed. He was born this way. He was born defective, correct? And so Jesus enters into the very pages of Genesis. And just the way God formed a new person out of dirt, a person who had never existed before, Jesus forms new eyes from dirt. This is happening right now. This is a God moment. Creation is good. The book of Genesis says that creation is good. Healing is good. Grace is good. Jesus performs a miracle that up until now had never been done. This could only be performed by God. Not to mention that in the Old Testament, there's, there's no record of anyone ever being healed of blindness. And it's because being healed of blindness was a sign of the Messiah. So nobody could do it until the Messiah had done it. Only the Messiah would heal the blind. That was the sign that we were going to look for. So we read this story, a man who was blind, and he can now see. But we're going to continue to read this story. And we're going to witness the people who saw this miracle. They were witnesses to it. And yet, this amazing miracle that only the Messiah could do, only one person gives God glory. Only one person worships. And everybody else reacts differently. Let's look. Let's look at how the world reacts to God's mercy. First, the world denies it. The world denies it. Verse 8 says the neighbors and those who had seen him as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, It is he. Others said, No, but he looks like him. And he kept saying, I am the man. His own neighbors witnessed this miracle, and they deny the miracle. Now, these might not be his, you know, next-door neighbors, 
the Bible says that he used to sit and beg. So these might be the shop owners who sat on either side of where he used to beg. Why wouldn't they want this miracle for this man? This is their neighbor. This is their friend. Well, maybe not their friend. I mean, at best, he's an annoyance, right? Scaring off potential customers from their store. I mean, sure, they knew he was out there. They probably never actually went out there to look at him, though, or to give him the time of day. And they walked by him every now and then. I mean, even right now, they're not even really talking to him. They're talking about him. They're talking about him like he's not even there. They say, I mean, I, I, he kind of looks like that guy, but it's safer just to deny it. You and I see God's mercy, and we experience his mercy every day. But do we worship him for it? Do we acknowledge that mercy before others? Or do we deny it? I mean, it's safer just to say, well, you know what, I'm not really sure. It's easier to say, I, I didn't really see anything. Second part, the world is offended by God's mercy. Verse 15 says, so the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes and I washed and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was division among them. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? He said, he is a prophet. The Pharisees say, this is their argument, this man can't be from God, he can't be the Messiah, God would honor the Sabbath. <laughs> but that's a man-made rule. They are ignoring the sign of the Messiah and their excuse is, well, this isn't how we expect God to act. But God never said that you can't show mercy on the Sabbath. God never said you can't do good on the Sabbath. Did you ever wonder why the Pharisees were so thick, so stubborn, how they could know so much and then completely miss seeing Jesus? Why are the Pharisees offended? Probably because they saw that same blind man every day too. And they did nothing. The Torah instructs them to show mercy. The Torah instructs them to show grace, to show kindness. But they believe that he's just some dirty sinner and he's getting what he deserves. Jesus comes along and Jesus does something. And the Pharisees are offended. So how come, how come God works through Jesus and not me? I mean, if God works through Jesus and not them, what does that say about Jesus? What does that say about them? Verse 24 says, So for the second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know this man is a sinner. He answered, Whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to be his disciples? And they reviled him, saying, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, why, this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Why is mercy offensive? Why is grace offensive? Because there is pride in hard work. There is pride in effort. And I think to myself, well, I'm a good person. I'm a good person, and I work hard at being a better person. In fact, I, really, I work really hard at it. I read my Bible, I pray, I pay my taxes, I go to church. Listen, so I deserve heaven. After all, look at everything I've done. Look how good I am. The Pharisees deserve to go to heaven. 
But this man born blind, God is just, and he is getting what he deserves. People shouldn't receive grace for free. After all, I, I work hard for my salvation. But the message of Jesus is what? Well, listen. Listen, Jesus reads his mission statement. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus does not just restore sight. He also sets people free. Jesus opens up prisons. Listen to that very carefully. Jesus opens up prison doors and sets prisoners free. Who are prisoners? People who deserve to be in jail. Isn't the court system just? Of course it is. Don't prisoners deserve to be in jail? Are the Pharisees offended by God's justice? No, but they are offended by his grace. God's grace is offensive. God's mercy is offensive. I deserve to go to heaven, not these people. Grace is offensive because of the one who receives it. If God saves me and he saves a criminal, well, what does that say about the criminal? What does that say about me? The world turns a blind eye to God's grace. And it's offensive. And it's inconvenient. The Pharisees don't believe the miracle, so they go and they grab his parents. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son? who you say was born blind, how then does he see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind, but how he sees we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be the Christ, they were to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. Wow! So his parents recognize him. His neighbors, mm, not so much. But his parents do, and they find out that their son can see. After being blind his entire life, and they fall down and worship God for this miracle. They bust out the champagne, they hug their child. Nope. Instead, they think to themselves, well, this is awkward. This could not have come at a more inconvenient time. And in fact, instead of being honest and forthright, his parents cower before the synagogue leaders. Why? For fear of being kicked out of the synagogue. Instead, they think to themselves, we can't. We can't admit this. This isn't a good time. Recognizing God's grace, giving glory to God at this point, is inconvenient. If I somehow acknowledge God's grace, then it might mean something bad for me. But this is truth. Shouldn't we admit the truth? You'd think. But some people would rather hold on to a lie and not admit the truth because they've already committed they already doubled down. I can't admit I'm wrong now. Look at the Pharisees. It's staring them in the face, literally. The grace of Jesus is staring at them with working eyes in the face, and they can't admit it. The answer is Jesus, <laughs> right? Jesus is the Messiah. Well, it, it, it can't be that because we've already bet on him not being the Messiah. This miracle is really coming at an inconvenient time for us. And this isn't the only time that it happens. If you skip ahead a couple chapters in John 12, it says this happened all the time. Many 
even of the authorities, believed in him. But for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it, so that they would be put out of the synagogue. For they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. Worshiping God is inconvenient. It's not a good time for me right now. I, I, I'm too afraid of what other people will think of me. I, I can't admit that I was wrong about that. I mean, sure, there is a mountain of evidence, but I've already kind of slid all my chips across the table. It's better for me if I just keep up this charade. Why is God's grace inconvenient? Because of what it says right there at the end. We love the glory that comes from man more. There's got to be one more response. There's got to be one more response to God's grace. It's the receiver. The receiver of God's grace responds with worship. John 9 says, But others said, How can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was division among them. So they said to the blind man, What do you say about him, since he has opened your eyes? And he said, He is a prophet. And then you jump down to verse 35, and what does it say? Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And then having found him, wow! Do we just skip by that and not see what that says? Jesus heard how this man stood up to the synagogue leaders. Jesus heard how this man was faithful. Jesus heard how this man stood his ground. Jesus heard how this man witnessed, how he testified on Jesus' behalf. Jesus heard about him and then went after him. Jesus heard about it and found him. And Jesus says, do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, and who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Tell me. Tell me where the Messiah is so that I can worship him. Jesus said, you have seen him, and it is he that is speaking to you. And the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. The man born blind is the only one who responds correctly to God's grace. His neighbors, the Pharisees, even his own parents, they all turned a blind eye to it. And if I were to grab your hand right now, and I were to take you, and I was going to say, come and see Jesus, I would take you to a man who was both just and merciful. Jesus came to open the eyes of the blind and to set people free. And he also said of himself, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Now lost is the Greek word apolomai. Apolomai is used in two different ways in scripture. It either denotes something that's lost or uh, it means to kill someone. Like how Herod kills the children in Israel. Jesus said he came to save those who were lost those who've been killed by the world, those who've been buried, those who've been put away. He came for the condemned. He came to set the prisoners free. He came for those who feel their lives are useless. But the politically correct world is offended by that mercy. I'm not lost. Other people are lost. Other people are wrong. Not me. They're, they're wrong. But I don't think the word lost is a bad thing. Why? Because I don't ever use the word lost for things that I care about. If I throw something away and Joanna says, where did it go? I don't say, well, it's lost. I say, I threw it away. But if I lost my wedding ring, I would say, I lost it. Why? Because I would feel the loss. With the word lost, there is a term of endearment. It's a word of emotion and there's feeling attached to it. What if you lost your job? Wouldn't that be devastating? You wouldn't say, I misplaced my job. We lose things of value. So when Jesus says, we are lost, that means we're worth finding. Jesus gives us mercy and value. And he says, I've come for them. Jesus didn't see a blind man. He saw his child and he came for him. Jesus said that was his mission. 
So as Christians, we need to ask ourselves, well, if that was Jesus' mission, is it still ours? Is it still our mission to be the one who seeks and saves the lost? It better be, because there's still lost people in the world, right? Look, if there's no lost people in the world, then we should just call back all the missionaries. We should lock the doors. We should pack our bags, because Jesus is coming soon. But as long as there is one lost sheep in the field of 99, the mission continues. God has a purpose and a plan for this world. And either at one time or another, you and I, everyone, right? Everyone, we have all veered from that plan. I know I have. If you can think of it, I have done it. That's what I used to tell my youth group kids. Just because I'm a pastor doesn't mean I've lived a perfect goody two-shoes life where angels just carried me from one blessed moment to the other. The Bible says in Romans 3, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Isaiah 53 says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. Tell me something. Who is exempt? Who is exempt from God's justice? Who is exempt from sin? Who does the Bible say is exempt from falling away? Who doesn't get lost? Who lives a perfect life? Who deserves heaven? Who really deserves God's mercy? Is it the Pharisees? Is it pastors? Is it Christians? Is it Texans? No. What does the Bible say? All are lost. Who have sinned? All. How many have fallen away? All. So who does Christ come for? Who does he show mercy to? All. Me, you, everyone. Why? (laughs) Why does he care? Why did he come? Why didn't he just come and set himself up as a powerful king? I mean, he could have done it. He could have come for personal glory. He could have came for fame. He had all of that within his power. Why did he come for me? Because lost things can't find themselves. When my wedding ring is lost, it can't find itself on its own power. When my child is lost in the mall, he can't find himself. And and I know what you think, that if you just try harder, If you just work a little harder, you're going to defeat darkness. You're going to defeat your sin. And then you will earn reward. You will deserve God's mercy. But you can't. Matthew Matthew chapter 4 is another example of why Jesus came. It says, As Jesus went through all of Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people, His fame spread through all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis, and from Jerusalem and Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. What do we see Jesus do in his ministry? Three things, right? Jesus' life is a three-point sermon. He preached, he taught, he healed. Can I ask you a question? And really, 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 really think about this. And this is a really good question to leave on as we go. Is this what we see the church doing now? Are we preaching and teaching and healing? Uh, One third of Jesus's ministry is health care. Is that important? I think so. Yeah, but the church can't heal the sick. The church can't heal the blind. Can't it? Shouldn't the church be doing all three? Isn't the church also a a hospital for the sick and for the dying? Isn't every single church member a minister? Doesn't each one of us also have a story? Isn't this why we sing, I once was lost and now I'm found. I once was blind and now I see. Pastor Rick Warren said, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. I know we can pray for a lot of things in this world, our economy, our government, our climate. Do we pray for healing? Why not? Jesus was a healer. If I grabbed your hand and said, come and see, I would take you to a healer. James 5 says the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. 
The way Jesus displayed justice and mercy was through his preaching, his teaching, and his healing. And that should still be the mission of the church. I want to be like Jesus. I don't know about you, but we have this example, and I want to follow it. I I know people who've shown me other ways. The world has shown me other ways to deal with my neighbor. The world has taught me to judge, to point fingers, to backstab, to gossip, to accuse without knowledge, to condemn without evidence. But that's how the world does it, and I don't want to do it that way. His neighbors, his parents, and even his rabbi couldn't see. They couldn't worship. They saw only the justice. But the blind man said, show me. That's the irony. The blind man said, show me the Messiah so that I can worship. I want to follow Jesus. I want to follow my rabbi. I want to follow my teacher. I want to follow my healer. Jesus and his disciples see a man born blind from birth. The Pharisees and his neighbors and even Jesus' own disciples saw a sinner. But Jesus saw an opportunity. Jesus saw an opportunity to show mercy. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Jesus is both just and merciful. And he's right in front of us. If we will just open our eyes and see. Pray with me. Lord, thank you for these stories. Thank you for your word. Here's another thing that I might take for granted. Your word of God. This book, these pages, this Bible. Lord, it is filled with stories about my Messiah. A Messiah who was a teacher and a healer. Lord, even if I look back on my own life, I can tell a story of being lost and being found, being blind and being able to see. And there are still people in this world who need that story to be their own. Your gospel should never be inconvenient. Your gospel should never be ignored. Your son, never inconvenient. He should be worshiped. The Bible says the goal is one day every knee bows and every tongue confesses. That is our, that's our job. That's what you want from us more than anything. To be unashamed, to witness, to be bold, to proclaim, to take others by the hand and to say, come and see. Come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. We have found the Messiah. Come and see. Lord, I pray for healing. I pray for healing in my own life. I pray that you continue to show me the broken things in my life. Only you can heal them. Lord, I pray for the healing of others. Not just physical healing, but spiritual too. I pray for the healing of this nation. I pray for the fracturedness of this world. Lord, only you can put things back together. Only you know how to mend. Thank you for every act of mercy. Thank you for every act of justice. Thank you for every act of kindness and every act of grace. You alone, you alone are to be worshiped. You are my Messiah my rabbi, my teacher, my healer. Amen. Once again, thanks for watching. Thanks for being a part of this community. Thanks for uh, taking the time uh, to have this teaching. And I'm going to remind you that you're listening to an MP3 or you're watching a YouTube video. You can always clip and copy 
the address above you and post it to your own page if it's not inconvenient. Post it to your own page and tell others, share, witness, proclaim this Messiah, this Jesus whom we love. I'll see you next time.